since we always have um, that our hour together goes by so quickly. Cooper. Um, and uh, so uh, Miss Sarah Hansen was in our last one. Um, so I, I hope it isn't too redundant for you. Um, but I, I find that every group has its own um, unique personality and interests and conversations. So it's good to good to have each of you um, this evening. So um, since we have so little time where we're actually synchronous, I don't want to spend too much time being um, a talking head, but just kind of set the stage as um, that uh, since we're at the beginning of our seven weeks together and already we're um, one week down and half a week or halfway through our second week, that um, week seven is just zooming toward us. It goes by all too fast. So um, we have our big uh, final project that we're working toward to be able to show all that we know about um, exemplary teaching in the 21st century. And so that's kind of everything that um, I hope to do to support you is to do what I can to help you feel successful in um, engaging that topic and making it useful to you rather than something you just have to jump through a hoop because you're working on your master's degree. I want it to actually be meaningful. So with that said, um, uh, if you would also put just, I, I, except for Mr. Kevin, who is driving, um, put something in the chat so that I can be sure that I get the attendance right. And um, anytime if you see something on the grade book and you're like, oh, she didn't record that, that doesn't look right, just let me know, I'll fix that. Sometimes people don't want to say anything and then um, things get submitted for final grades and it's like, oh, you know, then it's much harder to go back and fix it. So just let me know if you see something that doesn't look right. Um, you're like, I was at the Zoom, but you didn't mark me there or something like that. Just let me know. I'll fix it. Okay. So um, that enough said with from me. Let's hear what you have, what your thoughts are, and and um, where you want to begin with our fascinating um, topic of exemplary teaching in the 21st century. I am super good at wait time. <laughs> I guess I have a question or it might be more of a comment. I was watching your video on the final project uh -huh. to like simplify it. It is a paper. Yes. But it is meant to be like a plan in order to implement these things to become a, a better teacher that more inclusive things like that is that accurate that is a hundred percent like if we had another seven weeks I would say okay let's start to collecting data like what's your benchmark for your where you're starting and then how do, are you implementing it how's it going um but we we only have time in our seven weeks to create the plan and then hopefully it'll be useful for you that not only will you be able to use it in your own classroom, but you can support and help others that may not have the opportunities to um, take a class and have our learning community. Um, so maybe you can share, you may find instances where you're like, oh, but I've already looked at this. Here's an idea. So, but that's it, exactly. Were there particular concepts that you were um, wondering about? I know the the very foundation, the first part of the project slash plan is understanding um, inequities, the opportunity gap, and um, how that's related to trauma. And a lot of you may be um, familiar with ACEs 
and that has been a useful tool in, tool in schools, but often it doesn't look at how schools and classroom uh, interactions and um, experiences in the classroom can also be traumatizing. So um, this is kind of a, a, the, you know, this is what we'll really be kind of basing a lot of our um, part one of our uh, final project with. Um, and a lot of you on the on the um, discussion board did such a great job of um, really looking or using Gorski to um, unpack some of the issues of, of um, the opportunity gap. So I know sometimes it may feel like, oh, these things are such macro issues that are, you know, like we need to wait for the great revolution. Um, but um, they actually get enacted in classrooms and sometimes it's overwhelming and we don't necessarily know how to um, think about um, uh, these systems, these patterned inequities, because our society tends to look at things individualistically and also fairly ahistorically. And so we often don't see how patterns over time will build up and contribute to patterns of inequities that shape our behavior. So we are inheriting a society in, in uh, relations in schooling, and then um, we, we pick it up and it's like, we can either be a dream keeper or someone that either helps to maintain the status quo or even a dream wrecker. And most teachers do not go into schools to be anything other than a dream keeper. When we look at why people go into school, into to our profession, they usually do not say, um, because I wanna get wealthy. Um, they usually know that they're gonna be underpaid, overworked, underappreciated, and um, just um, in general, um, be working against the grain. So we have a very important um, job and one of our uh, roles is fundamentally about addressing those opportunity gaps. So are, are there any like kind of questions about, about that or how that works out? And it's such a foundational piece and sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around. I guess something that I have been struggling with recently in particular is knowing that most people did not become a teacher to, to be a dream wrecker, as you put it. Yeah. And recognizing that the spot that they're in is different from the spot that is ideal, I guess. Like, mm -hmm. how do you find the balance in advocating for those students or those populations or those things and I don't know like not finding a battle you can't win like how do you find the balance between advocating for those things that are so important and just like maintaining your own sense of peace or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that's a good question because you don't want to burn out, you know. Um, what, especially we're coming out of the, um, you know, a time where it was intensively the the COVID nineteen pandemic, and you know, teaching was has been definitely very hard. And they've done some recent surveys and found that um, over forty percent of teachers in classrooms today. Um, across the United States are thinking about getting out of the out of our profession. So I mean that is a huge number of people who are thinking about taking action to leave our profession. And then you add that too that a lot of people have acted on that and have left our profession so that we have this big teacher shortage um, across the country. Not to mention that um, people who do become teachers, um, within the first five years of their career, um, by year three, we we lose a very good big portion of, of, of teachers. So it's just, you know, that it's, it's something where 
Um, it's not that society puts a lot of value into what we do. And um, often we're very isolated working in our own little castles, our own little classroom spaces where um, I know as a teacher, just like many other teachers, I tend to be a little bit territorial. And so that sometimes adds to the um, isolation. Um, so, it, you know, that can be overwhelming. And then to say to teachers who really haven't um, often knowing that our teaching profession is still over 80% uh, white, mostly white women, and most of the women that our teachers are um, primary English speakers. Um, and so they are, mo I'm like the living exemplar of what most of our profession is. I started out in uh, a working class. Neither of my parents had graduated from high school. And then I did, woohoo. <laughs> and so I was the first generation to go to college. And so I kind of pulled myself up by the bootstraps. And like many teachers, I became a teacher and moved from the more working class into more of a middle class. So lots of teachers are, are like me. And so because of that, there's a very big um, disconnect a lot of times in our experiences as the um, kind of the normative standard in as uh, teachers and their experiences. And then what is what the, um, the browning of America, the minoritizing of public schools, our population in classrooms is significantly different um, and has been since the uh, 60s, just increasingly multilingual. We've always been multilingual, but we're becoming um, ever more so and um, racially diverse, linguistically, religiously, and so on. So you add that, you kind of got that, um, that situation where a lot of our main body of teachers we haven't had experiences of really living in the the uh, shadows of of the isms. We haven't um, often um, experienced a lot of things like being an economic refugee or whatever. And so that that means that often we aren't as familiar with how do you handle the stress of now having it plopped in your lap to say, okay, now I want you to deal not only with ABCs, but I want you to deal with social inequities. You know, that does seem like this huge, ridiculous thing where um, historically schools were one institution amongst many institutions that um, like churches, um, uh, community clubs, groups. So you used to have a lot of um, a lot of institutions that were working on behalf of rising generations, and schools were just one. And so now we've kind of, you know, the church attendance in many parts of the United States is is declining, and and so on. So you don't see that as much. And so teachers are kind of increasingly just left there and expected to be these miracle workers who are underpaid and overworked and supposed to just create all these miracle things with um, all of these um, uh, issues that are historically um, generated have been here long before you or I came and um, will likely outlive us. And so, and yet we're still supposed to mitigate that. Um, so, and then probably the cherry on top is that people like me, um, teacher educators, so people in my role, we have historically not done a good job of preparing teachers to go into the classroom and address this. And then we look at you as in-service teachers and say, now, why aren't you doing this? Why is the educational pipeline leaking? Why aren't you addressing linguistic differences? So we kind of blame the very people that we have not done a good job preparing. And so all of this is kind of landing on you. And obviously it makes sense that it's overwhelming. The, the thing that I have, um, found in my research and just looking and being an educator for 30 years and just talking about this and 
studying it um, over gen over decades and over different sections of the United States is that um, oftentimes groups that have been um, the targets of oppression like racism, sexism, or whatever, then they often have built up this collective wisdom about how to deal with these very big issues that maybe if we aren't used to it as the mainstream group in the teaching population, other groups have been dealing with this generation after generation. So for example, um, if you think back to the um, thumbnail uh, briefs about exemplary black teachers, um, Big Mama and Mama were teaching during the time of Jim Crow segregation. And that was a tough time too. And of course they were dealing with insufficient resources with um, a lot of uh, racial hate and racial violence and so on. So definitely, you know, it's like all this stuff was being put on them as well. So how did they deal with it? And basically they, they saw their mission as, as being, um, as providing education as the way. And so they had kind of a collective where um, they, it was like, what do we have to do to um, equip this rising generation to be able to be productive, healthy members of society in a society that doesn't necessarily value us? And so, um, so a lot of times the answers of how do you deal with that are modeled by other groups. So for, for myself, um, when, I was, um, when I was a kid, I didn't even know, I, I was born in the late 60s, I'm Gen X. And so um, I thought that um, social inequalities had been handled by Dr. King and, and um, colleagues uh, when I was a baby. And so I was like, good, we're past that. And then I became a mother of children that couldn't pass as white and a teacher of children who couldn't pass as white. And suddenly I began to see that these issues had not been taken care of. And so um, a lot of knowing how to address it came from my uh, collaboration with um, other people, with other teachers, teachers of color, uh, teachers who had been uh, dealing with this for a long time, how did they equip their the children to learn how to be um, successful in society and still be proud of being Latinx or or uh, black? And so um, there's it's it seems like it's this huge thing that you have to wait for the revolution but it's actually on the day-to-day -day interactions in your classroom with the particular children that are in your classroom. So you look at each of them and say, okay, what, what, is, what is going on here? Like, let's say that you were um, teaching uh, on the west side of Salt Lake City School District and you, were, you knew that a lot of the kids were economic refugees and primary speakers of Spanish or another <clears throat> language that's not English, then you would, you would think to yourself, okay, I've got to um, help them to uh, be successful in school and I have to help them to know that it's okay and it's wonderful to be um, a primary Spanish speaker and develop English as another um, fluency, that that's really amazing to have the talent to be a bilingual speaker. You can be a Hispanophone and successful in school, and you're also challenging and pushing back against this idea that Spanish is, is not a, a good a valued language. So, you know, in, in US society, we often, English is the high status language and any other language is seen as lower status. 
So we're very happy if primary English speakers learn to speak another language, but that's optional. And if we have um, primary speakers of other languages in our society, we say, you better learn English. And that's not optional for them. So you see this unequal valuing of it. So as a teacher, you can kind of push against that devaluing of Spanish and help them to see you know, that, that that is valuable and they can use it as um, a resource, a gift in their life. And I think another example would be, let's say that you have, um, you are either a science teacher in um, secondary education, or you are an elementary teacher who is responsible for teaching um, science as well. As elementary teachers, we teach everything. And um, so you have girls in your classroom and you know that um, girls and women are underrepresented in STEM fields. So you're going to pay attention to that and you're going to make sure that not just the boys, but also the girls have high levels of academic achievement. And you really encourage them to see themselves as scientists. Girls, you too can be a scientist. And we're gonna look at this as scientists, um, not just the boys, but girls too. And so you can be a girl and very feminine and a scientist. Do you see what I'm saying? And so, and then you're also dealing with that criticality, that critical consciousness, because you know that girls are getting messages from the time that they're very young, that we, that girls that are too smart, that they are too um, active, we have words in our society for them. Uh, one word would start with a B and rhyme with which, you know, so we have words in our society like that. So there's lots of images and messages that uh, women should not be doing that. And hence, you don't see them as much in, um, in uh, STEM fields. So you're going to push against that. And so those are macro issues that play out right in your classroom with little Susie. And so you're going to look at each child in your classroom and see what are the issues and you're going to say, okay, what do I have to uh, look for? What do I have to uh, focus on to make sure that each of my students has their full opportunity to develop their gifts and talents and be all that they could be without being boxed into like, this is the girl box. This is the, um, the box where the normative standard is being heterosexual, you know, that you can be transgender and successful in school, and you can be uh, black and successful in school. So you're kind of looking at the dynamics in your specific classroom with your specific children and seeing what are those things that are acting and functioning to push them out. Is it poverty? You know, is it, um, is it language that the devaluing of their primary language? Um, is it religion? Is it um, their uh, racial background? And so you look at each child and you address that, even though it seems like, whoo, how can I deal with all of these, um, you know, unequal pay in society and, and things like that? There's, those are so big. But in our own classrooms, we're in charge of what happens in our classroom. And so you, you hear of these students like I have, where the teacher tells me, you know, little Henry, his grandpa, his dad, his uncle, his brother are all in jail. Mm -hmm. So probably he's going to go to jail too. And you're like, well, you know, I don't handle incarceration rates. I don't do all that. But when Henry is in your classroom, that's your time to work with him and teach him right then because he's not in jail right now, right? <clears throat> and so you're addressing that with the particular children in, their cl in your classroom. So it definitely, uh, no doubt, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would say, you know, 
when my um, child came home from kindergarten and was trying to wash his brown skin off, you know, I knew that was a historical devaluing of Latinx people, um, but I needed my son to know that his color was a good color and that he is a good person, even if he's getting messages that he's the wrong color. So he could be a successful in school and be a child named Marcelo Juarez. Does that help at all? I know it's just so overwhelming, huh? <clears throat> it is definitely overwhelming, but that does help. Thank you. Yeah. You know, that's why I think it, it would be, these kind of classes would be best if we were like partnering up where we would be able to say, well, let's go visit a classroom and talk to a teacher that does that. Um, and we tried to do that in the undergraduate a little bit. Like when I was in Alabama, it was, it was not rural. Mobile is a big metro area. And so most of the public schools are, are African-American. The um, white people with the de desegregation largely said, I'd rather not. And so they created a lot of parochial schools. And so you have this where you have like 100% Black public schools. Not all of them are 100% Black, but they're mostly overwhelmingly Black. So, but most of our teachers in our College of Education going into teaching were still overwhelmingly white and primary English speakers, even though our city was 49% um, or 54% Black we still had more white people going into education. And so then they would uh, go out to the schools and see these exemplary black teachers and they'd be like, wow, that's how it's done. And one of my students, he was so cute and so courageous. And, and he said to this one a teacher, he said, but do I have to be black? And the, the, the um, exemplary black teacher, she said, she laughed a little and she said, no, you don't have to be black. What you have to do is make connections. You have to be able to make caring connections with them and actually see and hear the children and what's going on with them. And so a lot of times it'll be something like, look, I know you didn't have electricity last night but you still have to be in class. You still, education is the way. I know these things are happening. Oh, you didn't bring your uniform? We have uniforms in, in the South. You didn't bring your uniform? No excuse. Here, put this on. We're going to be learning. And so that, that was how it was like understanding the realities of what was going on and yet still saying, um, this classroom is not a holding pen. It's not a holding pen. This is a teaching and learning space. Because a lot of times, um, and even this was when I was teaching in Salt Lake City School District, I had a lady that was teaching across the hall from me. And I wondered if she actually taught. She was always in the hallway giving naughty slips out. And so most of our students were um, Latinx. A lot of them were Polynesian. Um, uh, most of them we're dealing with issues, um, challenges of poverty. And so that teacher used her classroom as a holding pen um, because it was like, well, when do you actually have instructional time? And so she wasn't teaching, but she was doing a lot of naughty notes. And so um, it, it definitely matters what you're doing in your classroom and um, how do you do that, you know? So especially when you're, uh, you know, I, I honestly feel that teacher education fails um, teachers so terribly sometimes when we send you out there and then the realities of, of actually teaching in a diverse society um, hit people and then they don't know what to do and there's not a lot of support, which does not mean that teachers are bad people at all. Um, they just weren't prepared. So that that is definitely a, an issue with um, teacher education that we don't prepare people um, as well as we could and should. And then we blame teachers. <laughs> hmm. 
Miss Chantel just got us going in such a wonderful way. I'm kind of glad you said all this because before this, um, I was actually telling my husband that I felt so frustrated because I tried doing everything I can in my classroom. But then I think about the things that my students deal with outside of school and the system just keeps failing those low income communities and people of color. And then I get frustrated because I find myself going in circles and not being able to solve the problem. But now that you've said this, I'm like, okay, like I can't control what happens outside of school, but I can control what I do for my students. Yes. So that kind of gave me a different perspective. <laughs> yeah. And I've been there. In fact, um, that was some of the reason why, um, you know, I was, I, I wanted to go to, to graduate school and eventually finish my doctorate because I was so frustrated by that kind of vicious cycle where it seemed like, you know, I was working so hard in my own classroom and I, I was really making some, um, you know, big process and progress. And I had, I, I was able to loop. So I had second graders that did not know all of the letters of the alphabet and they could not write their full first and last names in the third grade. And so, um, and they had been in the U.S. public schools since a preschool. So this wasn't like you could say, well, they had been outside of the country or whatever. And particularly a lot of school systems outside of the United States are much more rigorous than ours. So that's kind of a misnomer that um, if they were out of our country, then they didn't get a good education. Often it's much more rigorous. But anyway, so I would have just, just I had these eight-year-olds who were like, already believed that school was so horrible. They had been in school, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and they were like, this is bad news. This was the time where that little girl drew a picture. She couldn't write and none of the students could write. So they, I said, well, no problem. Uh, just put a, draw a picture. And so that was the time that the little girl draw, drew a picture of herself giving me the finger. And so, you know, that that was really like, oh, my goodness, my teacher preparation program did not prepare me for this. And so she was so alienated at eight years old with public schooling. And so um, I was I had been in Mexico. I had been in South America. So I, I did not fall into that trap where my colleagues, they were telling me they were saying, you know, keep your manipulatives in the box. Don't even get them out. Don't bring out your books. Don't bring out this because these kids don't care about education and neither do their parents. A lot of deficit talk. So, but I don't believe that because I had been um, outside the country. I had seen that in South America that that, that was definitely not the case. So, um, so I worked really hard, accelerated the kids use Spanish in the classroom. We also, I had a Vietnamese child um, that year. So I tried to, I had a lot of um, Tongan children. So I try to bring in everything from the various cultures and we worked hard. So by the end of the school year, then um, they were really accelerated. And so then off they went. And it was exactly what you were, you're saying, Ms. Griselle, where um, suddenly where they were coming to school every day and they were like, can I please take a book home? And they would ask for books for Christmas and birthdays. And people would say, do you brainwash these kids? Cause they love to read. And so then the next year they like start dropping off. They're not coming to school as much. They start getting in fights, you know, all these kind of things. So I'm like, what in the world? you know, all of my hard work is not paying up. And so then I started looping where I had the kids in second grade. And then the next year I had them again for third grade, working so hard. And yet the system would kind of um, fall apart, you know, after that. And so um, that was what kind of brought me to graduate school where I was like, well, I, you know, I got to learn some more stuff. Clearly, I don't need, know enough. And then if I can help other teachers and new teachers, then maybe we can put a dent in some of this. 
Um, and yet this is 30 years later now. And I feel like um, I, I could be very discouraged and be like, man, 30 years and, and what has really changed? But I really got some, some deep insights um, from uh, doing this research with exemplary Black teachers. Um, so as we were talking about, uh, the conditions of education right now are not ideal. It's tough to be a teacher. You better be tough of spirit, tough of heart, tough of mind to be able to love students and love learning through these difficult times. But our generation is not the first generation to have it tough. So back before Big Mama, um, that generation, um, I, for example, in Alabama, um, they, they, there were underground schools because it was illegal to teach Black people to read and write. And then when it became okay to do it, then people started to get worried and they started burning down schools and assaulting the teachers because it was like, uh-oh, if you give minoritized people or people that have been excluded from quality education an education, then you don't know what they're gonna do with it and society's gonna really change. So they would burn down the schools and um, you know, assault the teachers and so on. And so then um, at, at that time, the idea was that you had to teach the children, us ain't hogs, you know, we're actually human beings. I know society is telling you that you're property and that you should be listed with the animals, but actually, no, you are a human being. And so then the next generation is having to hide um, when the Ku Klux Klan is burning down crosses, burning crosses in the yard and so on. So each generation has their own um, kind of tough times. And ours does too. Ours is a different kind of tough, but it's still really tough. And so what I learned from that was that each generation of these exemplary teachers over time, they would pass the baton. And so they would say, I'm gonna do everything possible in my classroom. And I am, I know that Joey's parents are selling crack after school and I hate that that Alicia's uh, mom comes to parent-teacher conference drunk, but at least she comes, you know? And so I, I say uh, things like that. I don't have any control over what they do outside of the classroom. The minute they enter my classroom, I'm the boss here. I, I don't mean boss in like a bad way, but I mean like I'm the adult. I'm the one with the institutional authority and I'm where the buck stops as far as there better be teaching and learning going on here. And so I'm in charge of that space. So I'm gonna do everything that I can with my space and my time. And then I just am going to, um, you know, try to um, understand too, that even though I don't always agree with what the parents are doing, I have yet to find parents that truly don't care about their children. They might not show it the way I wish they would show it. They might not show up the way I would hope that they would, but they do care about their children and they do um, want the best for them. And oftentimes this is a generational trauma thing where they've been traumatized at school and school's a bad place. And then they have their children going to the place that traumatized them. And so it ends up being like, I don't trust you with, with for me when I'll be showing up at their front steps. And they looked at through the blinds and they were like, oh, oh white lady, this is dangerous. This is bad. Um, anytime white people show up on my front door, that's trouble. And so I had to kind of learn to um, be patient with that, build trust with that and understand that. I can do everything that I can do. And then I'm going to understand that um, I don't, I ne won't necessarily see everything that the seed that I planted and, and, and tried to nurture. I may not see that bloom ever, but it may bloom. I just might not see it. It might bloom um, and they might reach out to me later. I've had students do that for me 
that um, they were in my third grade class and then they graduated from the University of Utah and they wanted me to come. So I've had that, but for the most part, I don't see how they bloomed or what kind of things that they happened. But I can say that I did everything that I could in my sphere of influence. And then what I'm trying to do with the rising generation of, of new teachers, because I'm 30 years in. So it's like, you know, I have to pass the baton. Like you all are where the buck stops now. You did rubber hits the road with you. And so, um, so I have a responsibility to you as well to do all that I can to foster your gifts, your talents, your uh, dispositions that you're able to be a dream keeper. And I pass that baton to you. And so then you will do the same for your colleagues and as you pass the baton too. So the thing that I learned, particularly from being in, being often the only white person in many Latinx situations and contexts, and then living in an all black context is that generally people tend to think about things in long-term and they think about it in uh, as far as I'm going to do what I can do, and this is probably going to outlive me, but I'm going to pass the baton. And so I'm doing my part in the chain, and then you take it next. So I'm going to do what I can to prepare you, and then you take it next. And so that, to me, it has been very hopeful, where um, I think for myself, I'm speaking of myself, I was a late bloomer and like understanding issues of um, inequity. And that's why I totally get and empathize when Chantel says that's overwhelming, cause it is. And I used to be like looking for the revolution. And then finally, um, I was fortunate enough that I went to grad school with almost all people of color. And so most of my teachers were people of color, my colleagues were people of color. And so oftentimes they were kind enough to correct me when I was just egregiously wrong. And they would they understood that I had not been dealing with this since I was a small child. So even my own children have a very deep understanding of racism and linguism and so on because they've been dealing with it since they were um, able to be conscious of the world around them, that they have the wrong skin and so on. So they kind of developed an understanding of that, where with me, I was in my mid twenties before I, I even began to understand it. And so I have been more of a late bloomer. And so I thought, well, if, if um, my work is all being done in the class, undone in my own classroom, let me try to help um, future teachers. That's where I'm going to try to contribute. And then I see, well, gee, 30 years in, and it's we're still struggling with many of the same issues. It could be very depressing. But then I really was tutored by these um, people from communities that over generations had built up all of this cultural knowledge and and wisdom where they were like, look, you got to be in it for the long haul. You got to be willing to do all that you can in the space that you are, and then you pass the baton. So you probably won't live long enough for it. But in the meantime, everything that you do make that matter. And I think teachers are in a prime position to be able to do that. We, we touch people's lives in such intimate ways where these young people um, spend much of their day with us and who they are and how they think about themselves is deeply influenced by us. So we are really where the rubber hits the road. I should say you are because um, I, I never stopped missing being a, a classroom teacher, um, but I, and my, my great love is working with teachers and future teachers because of how critical um, teachers are in um, young people's lives, the lives of the rising generation. So how will they be able to um, be able, be fully 
them with their gifts developed and able to participate in society and help to make the world a better place. So teachers are just so critical. And yet, how well do we equip them? So understandably, teachers get frustrated. What do you think, Mr. Briggs? <laughs> you look very pensive. <laughs> Not pensive. I just have enjoyed listening to you. Um to all of the discussion. So, uh, I guess, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it seems like it's a complicated issue. But on the other hand, it seems like it's a kind of a simple issue too, yeah. where really we just need to um, go into the classroom and be empathetic with, with our students and yeah. and understand that they might they might not um they're, they're not all coming from the same backgrounds and so they're not all going to learn the same way yeah. and 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 that's okay if we can care about them and we can find a way to help them on an individual level then you know and that gets more complicated than it than it probably needs to be sometimes too but yeah yeah so i don't know in one way it's super complicated and on the other hand it's like just be a good person and yeah. treat the kids like like they matter and yes that that is the fundamental ingredient that warm demanders do they see the children as human beings and treat them that way the exemplary teachers were not afraid to say i love you they literally told the kids i love you and, and they would say, because I love you, I'm not going to accept anything less than your best. So they were warm, but they were demanding. And they had that relationship with the teacher. So I think, you know, I would agree with you 100%, Mr. Briggs. I would say that the what, what some teachers miss is that you don't want to be colorblind. You don't want to pretend that those differences aren't there. So like for myself, if I identify as female, if you don't acknowledge that about me, I'm like, what do you see about me? Do you not see me? And so, and I know with, um, with my uh, children, if you met my son, Ricardo Alejandro Juarez, he, and you didn't see that he is super proud to be Latinx, it would be like, what are you seeing? Did you miss him? You know, and so the, what happens in our society is we, we have good intentions. We want to say, I don't care what color you are. You might be purple or polka dotted. And I would say, if you see a child that is purple or polka dotted, you should call the ambulance because people are not polka dotted or purple. So that being said, that only in a racist, um, sexist, homophobic society, would you pretend that you don't see what you do see? Because when we pretend that we don't see it, then we're sending a message that's something terrible about you. So if it's like, if it's a difference and clearly I can see it because fish, birds, and human do see color, they do see differences, then um, we can say, you know, that's an asset, that's a gift. Look at what you, you bring to us. For example, a child in a wheelchair, they know a lot about gravity. So our society is built for people that walk on two legs and do not have wheels to, to ambulate around. And so they know very well that our society it handles gravity with things like curbs, steps, so on. And so, but we don't have to, right? But, but that's just a normative standard is that we made our world so that we assume that everybody walks on two legs. So, and we know that not everybody does. Some people, you know, are in wheelchairs and so on. So um, kids see that, they know that, they, they look at differences. And so if they can understand that um, it's not a bad thing, then it really is kind of that direct approach where it's like, 
I care about you as a human being. And because I care about you, I want you to have this powerful thing that we call education. So the education that is so powerful, and this is why teachers are so dangerous. And people often think that I'm, I'm saying dangerous and they laugh, but actually teachers are very dangerous before good or ill. If you think about the butterfly girls te teacher, um, she may not have meant it, but she was telling that child, your story is the wrong, wrong story. So that's very dangerous in a bad way. In a good way, that teachers can unlock the power of, of learning and being able to assess the world around them and understand that they do have ability to make changes in their world. So you have people like Carter G. Woodson, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, a lot of these people over time, they were like telling the young people, the rising generation, look, I know it's tough, but you are smart. You are capable. You can make a difference in this world. Share your gifts, use your gifts with others and help to make the world a better place for all of us. And they had that belief and, and um, uh, uh, I think it was mama in the thumbnails where she would say, um, you're like a cake, you know, and you, the ingredients have to be put together so that you'll rise and then you'll be so amazing. And I, I just thought that was so powerful, the way that they saw education as this powerful tool. It wasn't simply that you're barking back um, facts, you know, um, because in the 21st century, facts are always changing, right? So that's the 21st century thing that's so unstable. The jobs and knowledge bases that they're going to need to know don't even exist yet. And so how do we help them to be uh, creative thinkers? How do we help them to learn to be problem solvers? So all of those things are very wonderful and necessary. The bottom line that you can always tell if, uh, if teaching is exemplary or not is do they address that criticality issue? Do they address that critical consciousness? Um, do they address how schools can be very traumatizing? Um, and over generations. That's what really makes the difference. So if um, sometimes these 21st century uh, approaches will um, act as if um, everybody is on an equal playing field already, but it matters very much what your body looks like. So, and the reason that I know that's true is because I just look at the different um, uh, uh, venues of our society. If I look at the prisons, they're overwhelmingly minoritized. If I look at uh, higher education, it's overwhelmingly white. So clearly something's happened. Your body matters, right? And if you are the wrong sexuality, we may kill you in our society. And we're working very hard to make sure that you have to stay invisible if you are transgender. Um, so it matters what your body is and, and, and how people see you. And so you have to have skills to be able to, and knowledge to be able to navigate that. And teachers that um, understand what they are preparing the rising generation for, the economy is changing. The, our society is changing. We're very interconnected because of technology and so on. And so uh, the shape of the inequities that we're dealing with are always uh, mutate, but they continue to be organized around issues of like race, uh, primary language, religion, um, ethnicity, sexuality, so on. So they, they just tend to take different forms. Dr. Rose, can I make a comment? Sure. Okay. So it was something that you talked about in the last call, and it was about inviting people to speak in our classes. And I think that that's really powerful. I became friends with a man from Texas, and he asked me to come to Texas to share my story. And then I asked him to come in and tell his. And he grew up in abject poverty and became a very successful 
businessman, city council, mm-hmm. and just a really, really successful man. And yeah. he shared his story. It was while we were, I was teaching House on Mango Street, but oh. it was interesting to get their perspective afterward. Yeah. But they saw it in a completely different way because they have just not been exposed. And he showed the spectrum, just like you said, with your son and how he's proud to be the color that he is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's they very really much see- he's very much aware that um being Latinx is devalued in in society. And even with my own students, um, when we would to walk to the library, um uh, one time there was a leather jacket missing uh, from the library right after we had left. We got a call from the library. Did any of your students have to happen to take a leather jacket? You know, the idea was that that um they they may have have taken it. And particularly as a mother, I, when I would take my children um, in the grocery store, it got to the point where um, I would walk into the grocery store with a chip on my shoulder. I'm like, you want to fight? <laughs> because I was so used to people expecting my children to shoplift. And so, you know, I, I was like, say something, do it. <laughs> because I was so used to my children being um, accused of, uh, of shoplifting just because of the way that they looked. And so um, as a teacher, having critical um, consciousness about that um, with with uh, stu- my students that I worked with in Alabama, when I would take them on trips, I would say, look, we know that it, when we go in downtown and if we don't act right, what are people gonna think about us? They wouldn't just think that it was a bunch of naughty kids. They would think it was a bunch of, of uh, bratty black kids, which was very different. And so I was aware of that. And we and the kids knew that too. They knew that very well because when our bus stopped at the local park where all the preschool moms had their children, the park cleared out when a whole bus load of black kids um, got off the bus. So they know very well. And how do we help them to see these different perspectives? And a lot of times the kids are more interested in the multiple perspectives anyway. You know, it makes more sense. So even you think about um, about uh, Utah history, if you go, let's see, I'm blanking on the name right now, but it's in Northern Utah and it has to do with the Shoshones. And there's plaques that have to do with the LDS um, pioneers and it, the massacres from their perspective, but the Shoshones actually had a very different perspective of what happened there. So do we tell, do we share the complexities of that? It's it's usually much more complex. And I, I think um, Mr. Briggs was talking about that complexity. Shoot, our, our hour just zips by. Oh. Now, keep in mind, um, we have two that are scheduled to Zooms, but we can always um, we can always do more. We can make them, um, if you would like to uh, join, uh, we could schedule more and make them voluntary, where if you want to or don't want to feel that would be helpful, we can do that. So keep that in mind as far as I don't want you to be um, struggling and, and being like, well, I think I understood the video and I think I understood the readings, but I'm still super frustrated, okay? Um, so don't hesitate to reach out and um, and let me know how I can support you, how I can um, uh, maybe answer questions or whatever it is that you might need, okay? Well, Thank you for a wonderful um, hour together. Appreciate y'all. As they say in Alabama, I enjoyed you. (laughs) Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Have a good night. Thank you.